So um, before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. I would also like to acknowledge the Bidigal people upon whose lands I live and work. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the elders both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. Okay. So welcome to the last workshop in the library's Open Access Week program, the last cab off the rank, so to speak. Um, today's workshop is about publishing in open access journals. And this is a rough plan of what we'll be covering. So we've planned the workshop, so the first half of it is a little bit information heavy and discussion-y. Um, we'll be talking about what is open access and clarifying some de definitions, addressing some common assumptions, and then we'll talk about predatory journals in detail and share some tips for avoiding them. And then these information heavy discussion parts will set us up with a shared understanding of what we mean when we say things like green open access or gold open access, because understanding those concepts will help us in the latter half of the workshop where Jim will be sharing us um, some practical strategies for finding high impact open access journals for your topic or for your research area. Um, so, I've shared a link to my presentation in the Zoom chat um, in case you'd like to follow along to this presentation in a separate tab. Um, and so you can also participate in the interactive activities, but we will also be emailing out the slides um, in PDF format to participants afterwards, just because um, in Menti, the links don't work and we have packed these slides with quite a few links. Okay, so first of all, what is open access? So on this slide is a definition that I've just taken from Open Access Australasia, but if we boil it down, what it's basically about is about removing barriers to research. So it's not just about making your research available to read for free. Um, open access is also about allowing people to use and build on your research without having to jump through hoops. So if someone can see that your research is available under an open access license, it's implied that they can download it, photocopy it, distribute it, link it, text mine it, transform it for analysis or, you know, what have you for their own purposes, so long as it's legal. Um, so on paper, this sounds great, right? You know, everyone should be interested in open access um, because it means you're opening your research to be used or to be put into practice, which at the end of the day is the end goal for all of our research, isn't it? So we can change the world improve practice, build on our knowledge, and add to the conversation. But when people start to look into open access, there's no shortage of myths and misinformation that we might encounter. Putting open access into practice can be daunting. So before we kind of dive into the rest of our workshop, let's first take a look at some of the myths that we might have heard of and unpack some of the assumptions. Okay. So this is the first myth. Open access journals are not peer reviewed. What's our gut reaction when we hear something like that? Do we agree? Do we not agree? Are we not sure? Um, if, you're, if you're not following along to the slides, but you'd still like to answer these questions, you can go to menti.com and use this code um, to access uh, the, uh, the form to respond. Okay, excellent. We're seeing a spread of responses, mostly skewed towards false. All right, just give it another five seconds um, for people to, uh, to give people a chance to respond. Okay, awesome. So as many of you suspected, um, this is a blanket statement which doesn't apply to all open access journals. So same as with traditional journals, you can find peer reviewed open access journals, you can find non peer reviewed open access journals. Uh, many high impact journals are open access like The Lancet Global Health or Materials Today or Advanced Science and they have a very rigorous peer review process 
and are highly regarded. So journals can exist on a spectrum between peer reviewed and non peer reviewed, same as um, traditional journals. Okay, so that's our first myth. Um, how about our second one? Open access journals are predatory. So what is your knee jerk reaction to a statement like that? Is it true? Is it false? Or are we not sure? Okay, lovely, we've got a not sure. That's good, because we'll address that in more detail in the um, later half of our workshop. Okay, good. So again, this is a bit of a blanket statement. Uh, many open access journals are highly respected, highly ranked, and are legitimate in that their aims aren't profit driven, um, their motives are scholarly. But many predatory journals don't have reputation or metrics to show as a reason for why you should publish in them. So they'll say, hey, we're open access, open access is good, you should publish with us. And that's where the myth comes from. Um, later on in our workshop, we'll talk a little bit um, in more detail about how to identify predatory journals and show you some practical strategies for how to locate open access journals and avoid those predatory journals. Um, and I just have one last myth. So open access journals have expensive article processing charges. What do we think? True, false or not true? <laughs> The article processing charge means the author need to pay the publishing fee. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So we've got a spread of responses for that one, which is great. Um, so while some journals will charge exorbitant fees for publishing in them, you actually don't need to pay article processing charges to make your research available open access. There are actually a few different avenues of making your research open access. Um, and for some avenues, the cost is money, for other avenues, the cost is time. So we'll unpack this in a little bit more detail shortly. So thank you everyone for participating in that activity. Um, now that we've talked briefly about some of the uh, myths and assumptions. Let's now talk in more detail about some of the benefits. So why it's worth publishing open access? Why is it worth it? First of all, the main benefit is that your research can reach a wider audience who can potentially make use of it. So these people might include practitioners or working professionals who can use your findings to change or adapt their practices. These people might also be government bodies who can use your recommendations to inform policy. It can also mean that not-for-profit institutions or smaller universities without good funding can still access good research. They're not limited by what subscriptions they can or can't afford. So that's the main benefit. You're removing barriers and you're putting your research directly into the hands of your users. And by doing this, you're maximizing your potential research impact. Secondly, um, quite a few studies over the years have found correlations between open access research and higher citation rates. So what is referred to as the open access citation advantage. So by making your publications open access, um, it really does benefit you because um, your author and your article metrics um, can, experience, can experience a bit of a boost as well. And finally, there is policy that you might need to comply with. So from a funder point of view, they are looking to maximize the value of your research investment. So if you have any projects funded by the ARC or the NHMRC, it's a stipulation that you make the outputs of that research open access within 12 months. So other people um, can basically view the fruits of your labor. And also from UTS's point of view, this institution is committed to producing and sharing research with community and global impact. Um, there's a new open access policy which outlines our commitment to open access. It came into effect just last week, actually. 
um, and it stipulates that at the very least, a copy of the accepted version of your manuscript must be deposited into the UTS repository so it can be made available under open access. So there are both benefits and also drivers for why you should be interested and be looking into open access. Um, just before I move on, I just want to show you all a snapshot of um, the UTS policy. So I've just got it open on a new tab here. So this is what the UTS open access policy look like. Um, we all, oh, excellent. Um, Helen's already linked it in the chat in case you'd like to have a look. Um, but do have a read of that because it is quite prescriptive in what um, uh, you must do as a UTS author. Right. Okay. So when it comes to the mechanics of how you make your research open access, there's a few different ways of doing it. So there's a few types of open access arrangements. Um, these arrangements tend to be named after a color and there are quite a few arrangements out there. So on this slide, I've just put in a selection. Um, there's actually a few more than what I've listed here. Um, but these are the most common ones that you'll run into. Gold open access is when the journal itself is open access. So to publish in a journal, you must pay an article processing charge. So these are journals like um, the BMC, PLOS One. Um, so those are fully open access journals. Um, when you publish in those journals, the article is available to anyone online free of charge. And there's also Creative Commons licensing applied. Gold hybrid is when you're publishing in a traditional journal, so journals where it's free to publish in and they recoup their publication costs using subscriptions. So the journal itself, um, I'm just going to refer to as a traditional journal. Uh, so gold hybrid is when you're publishing in a traditional journal, but you pay an article processing charge to make just your article open access. Um, and this article has Creative Commons licensing applied. Um, bronze means that you're publishing in a um, journal which is freely available to anyone to read but there isn't actually an open license applied to any of those articles so it might mean that you can't um, download or share the article as you wish um, so that's what's referred to as bronze open access um, these three types of open access um, to help make your research available under any of those arrangements the main cost is time um, green open access is when the accepted version of your publication is deposited into a repository um, and then this version is usually then made available after an embargo period. So for example, um, the accepted version can be made three months after the journal article version of your paper goes live or something like that. Um, to publish uh, via green open access or under a green open access arrangement, um, the main cost you'd be paying is time in the form of an embargo period. And it's this kind of open access which I'm just going to um, briefly expand upon because for the first three kinds of open access arrangements, it's quite straightforward how you do it. You pay a fee and then the publisher kind of takes care of the rest. Um, for green open access, um, it requires a little bit of legwork on your behalf, but not a lot of it, um, because it is quite an easy process, um, as you'll see shortly. Okay, so green open access is also um, referred to as self-archiving, so that's also another name that you might run into. It involves depositing the accepted version of your manuscript into the repository, so the public can access a version of your research. Um, the accepted version is the version that's gone through peer review, but it hasn't had um, any of the journal formatting or the typesetting or the tidying up of tables um, applied just yet, but the research itself is there. Um, at UTS, the institutional repository that we have is called OPUS. It stands for Open Publications of UTS Scholars, um, and it connects to Symplectic, which is the research output management system. So what you can basically do is use Symplectic to deposit directly in to Opus. Um, and one of my colleagues has made a wonderful three minute video showing you the process and it is quite easy um, how to actually make that deposit, which I've linked in the slides here. 
Um, but what I want to do is I just want to show you all a live example of what an output looks like when it's deposited into Opus um, and talk through some of um, the interesting things to make note of. Okay, so I'm just going to go to my tab and I'll just make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so this is an example of the accepted version of um, these authors' manuscripts that's been deposited into Opus. Um, as you can see, there's a flag here which indicates that it's open access, so available to the public. And if you look down here, there's an option to download the accepted manuscript version or to view it directly on the publisher's website. Um, but of course, if you are a member of the general public, chances are if you click on the publisher's website, you'll come up against a paywall like this, meaning you can't actually read it. So what they'll be doing is they'll be clicking on the first link here, downloading the accepted manuscript, um, where they can then access a copy of the research, which looks like this. Um, if someone uses the accepted version of your article, the citation they actually use is the citation for the publisher version. So it's one of the stipulations that if you deposit in a university repository, um, you have to provide a citation back to the publisher version of the article. So users will still have to use that citation to point back to the original article. So this usage will still contribute to your metrics and to your citation count, um, which is important to note. Um, what's also interesting is that um, Opus is also um, indexed by Google Scholar. So if someone wanted to find this article um, on Google Scholar, so say they're a member of the public, they're really, really interested um, in this article, but if they click on that, of course, they come up against a paywall asking them to pay um, $9 to read it. What they can then do is they can click on all 11 versions just underneath, and this will show you a list of all the repositories where this article is located. So you can see that this article has been deposited in a few different places like European C, um, a few other universities, and Opus appears down here. So um, we're one of the repositories that get um, indexed by Google Scholar, so we're very findable. Um, another interesting thing to note is um, it's more and more common nowadays for researchers to have extensions like Unpaywall loaded onto Google Chrome. So what this extension does is it looks for any open access versions of the article that you're currently looking at. So if you see here, um, this article, there's a paywall, I can't actually read it. If I click on my unpaywall extension, it'll actually take me directly to Opus where I can read um, the full text. So as you can see, it is quite useful to have a version of your research in the repository. It satisfies um, funder requirements and it's also another entry point into your research basically because it's still pointing back to the published article. Um, as mentioned, the only cost for publishing um, in uh, green, uh, for green or open access is time because you'll often need to wait out an embargo period before making your research available. Um, if you deposit into Opus, sorry for flipping my tabs so often, um, if you deposit into Opus, um, what library staff will do is they'll check copyright for you, but they'll also block access to your article until the embargo has lapsed. So here's another article that I've um, looked up. You can see that it's embargoed. And down here, it shows you when the embargo period expires. So uh, once 1st of July, 2022 rolls around, this will automatically unlock and be free to the public. Okay. Um, so just going back to my slides. Okay. So if you'd like to check how long um, the embargo period might be for a green open access article or what your other open access options are, you can check the journal website, but another great tool to be aware of is Sherpa Romeo. So what this is, is it's basically a website which summarizes publisher open access policies so you can see at a glance what you can and can't do according to what your journal permits. So how um, this works is uh, you basically go into the Sherpa Romeo website, um, which Helen has so kindly linked in the chat, thank you, um, and you search up your journal. So I'm just going to go back to the home page and I'm just going to pop in my example, Nature. Um, you can see here that it's got the publication information at the top, so you can be sure that you've located the right record. 
And underneath is a summary of the publisher policy and also the open access pathways. So it says here, if you'd like to make the published version of your paper open access, then there is an open access fee associated with it. However, if you do want to make the accepted version available, then you can um, do that. It's just an embargo period of about six months. And these are all the places where you can deposit a copy of the accepted version. So the institutional repository is one of those places. Um, there's also conditions like it must link back to the publisher version. The published source must be the one acknowledged in the DRA cited. So things like that, conditions for how um, the accepted version should look. So that's a very useful website to keep in mind in case you're interested um, in looking up journal policies. Um, it provides short, um, easy to read summaries and it saves you the trouble of having to um, read through several pages, potentially. Okay, um, so at this point, um, I might just pause and see if there are any questions in the chat before we move on to the next section. Uh, Helen, were there any questions? No. Um, I do have a quick question. I was just typing it out. But um, yes, so I was wondering, um, so in terms of UTS Opus, if I was a PhD student enrolled at UTS and about to complete my study, what is the benefit, I guess, um, to sign up a Opus account? Um, are we able to access it still long after graduating? Oh, so great question. So um, you don't have to sign up for an Opus account. It's mm -hmm. um, completely managed by the library. So if you want to deposit into Opus, what you do is you fill in a form basically, um, mm -hmm. just to say, yes, I'm the owner of this paper. Yes, um, you know, I've asked for permission for all relevant, you know, pictures um, and all that. You upload a copy of your thesis and then you send it to the library. What the yep. library staff will do is they'll double check the copyright and then uh, make sure that we can share it. There's no like, you know, embargo or closed access that needs to be applied. Um, and then they'll upload it to the repository. So um, you don't need to manage anything. Basically, we manage it for you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Great question. Okay. Yeah. And if you publish an article, you'll, you'll need to uh, log that uh, publication record in Symplectix. And then in Symplectix, um, there is a uh, option you can deposit to Opus. Yes. So it's a yes, streamline procedure. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Okay. So now that we've talked about open access um, for a little bit, let's now just switch gears and talk about predatory journals. So on this slide is another definition, which I pulled from an article about what predatory journals are, but it all boils down to um, them being publications that are driven by profit instead of scholarship, and they will usually employ shady means to try and get you to publish with them. Um, if you do publish with them, the harms can range from your research being overlooked because they claim to be in certain databases but aren't, um, your research not being properly peer reviewed because they favour turnaround over due diligence, or even reputation damage uh, for having your research be associated with them. So predatory journals are something that you need to watch out for and avoid. Um, but instead of going through, I guess, um, tips one by one, um, let's instead do a little bit of a thought exercise to unpick some of the indicators or red flags for predatory journals. So say you have a journal that's invited you to publish with them. Um, on this slide here, I've got a list of three things that you might have noticed about them. Um, what I want you to do is to use the sliders to indicate how big or small a red flag um, each of these characteristics are. So slide it all the way to 10. If you think danger, danger, run for it. Um, or keep the slider fairly low at zero or one if you think that that particular characteristic actually makes it sound above board. Um, so I hope I've explained that well and that makes sense. <laughs> Um, again, if you'd like to participate in this activity, um, please do go to mentee.com and then use the code 11611364 um, to get access to the response form. Um, otherwise, if you're following the line long in your slides, um, there should, uh, it should have popped up. Okay, lovely. We've got some responses trickling in, which is great.
We'll just give it another 20 seconds to allow people the chance to respond. Okay, so this is this is really great. So we can see here that um, the middle characteristics, so they've quoted uncommon metrics on the website, is a bit of a big red flag, and that is fair enough. That is a big red flag, isn't it? Um, often predatory journals aren't indexed in Web of Science or Scopus or are used in academic circles, so there aren't really any metrics for them to point to. So what they'll do instead is they'll either make up the information or they'll quote um, some weird metrics um, on their website instead. So I've seen things like Google Scholar impact factor, which is not a thing. Um, so they might claim, okay, we've got an impact factor of four, and then in tiny little brackets say, according to this obscure source. So do have a watch out for that. Um, it's always best to double check claims as part of your betting process for journals. Um, in terms of the first characteristic, um, having articles be findable in Google Scholar, um, this actually isn't something um, that, should, uh, that you should use to judge for predatory behavior, um, mainly because Google Scholar indexes anything from the internet, so they don't really have a policy for what they will or won't include, unlike databases like Scopus or Web of Science, where they've got a more um, strict uh, uh, cur uh, curation policy. So they'll only index peer-reviewed scholarly journals with ethical publication policies. So because anything can appear in Google Scholar, um, many articles of predatory journals tend to appear there. So um, even if you can spot articles in Google Scholar, um, please don't use that as an um, indication of, okay, this is legitimate because um, it's still grounds to be wary. Um, and for the last characteristic here, has an ISSN listed? So what an ISSN is a, a unique indicator for any serial publications. Um, it's actually very, very easy to apply for an ISSN. You just have to um, basically fill in a form, I think. Um, and it's just an identifier for a publication. So any publication can come with an ISSN. So it doesn't necessarily mean that a journal is legitimate. So um, this isn't something that you should depend on um, as a characteristic to watch out for. Okay. So thank you for participating in that activity. Um, I just have another list of three characteristics. So now that we've had um, practice responding with the sliders, um, I now want you to consider another three characteristics listed here. So say you've been handed another journal, and these are some of the things that you've noticed about it. How big or small or a red flag are each of these characteristics? Okay, typos, that's a big one, yep. <laughs> Okay, so just go through them again. Um, having a reputable editorial board listed on the journal website. Um, as mentioned, it's very, very easy for predatory journals to fake information, so don't take any information at face value. It's always best to cross-check these claims, so look up the members of the board, um, see if they have got an institutional profile or an ORCID or a LinkedIn, and see if they themselves list themselves as editors on um, their own profiles of that journal. Um, just to cross check that information. Um, typos in communications, now that's a really, really big indicator. Um, it can be a really, really easy giveaway, but keep in mind that more often than not, the website or the email can look very professional and very, very polished. So um, keep in mind that um, while that is an easy thing to spot, um, some of the predatory journals you come across 
um, might be a few a bit more sophisticated in their methods um, and so they won't have any obvious typos or anything like that. Um, the journal is brand new. So a journal being brand new doesn't necessarily mean it's predatory, but it's always, again, good to be wary. Um, new journals don't have any of the criteria present you use to judge for legitimacy, so they might not be indexed in databases just yet. Um, they won't have any journal metrics. People might not have heard them before, so and so on. So it's always good to be extra careful if a journal is brand new, um, just because you've got less criteria by which to judge it. So again, be wary. Okay. So thank you again for participating in that activity. Um, it's usually a variety of practices that'll make a journal predatory and not necessarily just one or two things. So on this slide are a few characteristics listed that tend to be, you know, the worst of the worst characteristics. But it's important to note that there isn't a particular threshold or characteristics that tips a journal into predatory uh, territory. It's kind of, um, you kind of have to look at the journal's practices as a whole and decide whether or not that publication will serve you well and put your research in the best light or whether or not publishing um, in that journal will do more harm than good. So um, do be on the lookout. Uh, as an example um, uh, of uh, an invitation you might receive from a predatory journal, um, this is what one might look like. So on the whole, there aren't many typos or grammatical errors. Um, however, some of the um, some of the turns of phrase are a little bit strange, like the author, greetings for the day. Um, that's a little bit strange. Um, but what ultimately tweaks you um, into thinking, okay, this is probably predatory, is 70% of the email is about different ways in which you can pay them um, before they've even, you know, engaged in any peer review or before they've even engaged in like, you know, any proper services for you. They've already listed various ways in which you can pay them. Um, so that's a pretty good indication that um, this might be a predatory journal. And you'll also notice that the amounts that they charge tend to be um, quite small, um, and that's mainly to catch you off guard. So if something's asking for thousands and thousands of dollars, um, chances are you'll be a little bit more careful before letting go of that money, whereas, you know, they're asking for $32 um, as an APC. Um, most people would look at that and go, oh, that's okay, um, here you go and not to look too much into it. Um, these lower charges are, are to catch you off guard, basically. Okay. Right. So when it comes to spotting predatory journals, um, lists can be very useful. So blacklists are uh, lists of um, known predatory journals um, that are published by different um, organizations or by different individuals. Um, but it's important to note that lists aren't definitive. So um, lists can, uh, it's impossible for any list to be completely 100% up to date just because new predatory journals appear all the time, so it's impossible for them to keep up. But it's also important to note that lists can also disagree with each other because, um, you know, what might be predatory to one person might not be predatory behavior to another one. So while lists are a really, really good starting point, um, it's best to, um, again, be wary because even if something doesn't pop up on a list, that doesn't mean that something's not predatory. A journal isn't predatory. Okay. Um, it's also important to note that um, another way for predatory journals to dodge notice is to simply just do a name change. Um, because then when you do a control F search for that journal name, it doesn't appear on the list. You might think, okay, this is okay. Um, but it's actually not the case. Okay, so when it comes to telling if a journal is predatory, it's good to run through um, a little checklist for yourself um, so you can, uh, so you have some criteria by which to judge. So some key things you should look out for are where are their articles indexed. So this is a big one. If you're a health researcher, chances are you want your research to appear in PubMed or Medline or CINAHL. Um, similarly, if you're um, an engineering researcher, you probably want your publications to appear in IEEE. It's important to make sure that where you're publishing does actually um, index it show up in the database um, that's used by most of the researchers in your discipline so they're not overlooked. It's also important to note that um, a lot of the databases which index research they have very very strict um, policies for what they will and won't include so 
um, for the most part, they will usually cut out all predatory journals. So that's already a good indication of whether or not um, you should publish with someone if they show up in a database um, or not. Um, do check if it appears in a white or black list. So if you can spot a name, then that's um, a little bit of a clue to maybe do a little bit more digging um, into the background of that journal. Um, and if it's asking for, for a fee up front, so if it's asking for, for a fee without, um, you know, you haven't even submitted anything, then that's kind of a sign to run. So those are some things to um, watch out for um, at the first level. Um, at the second level, do check to see if your colleagues have heard of the journal um, in question and also check to see if it has legitimate metrics. So metrics will um, usually describe the impact a journal has on a particular field of research. And because you want to publish in high impact journals, it's best um, to have a look to see if there are any metrics available to help you judge um, for impact. Um, and then at the end, um, I've just linked um, a checklist here called, from an organization called Think, Check, Submit. Um, they release an excellent um, checklist on their website, uh, which runs you through um, some criteria, some more criteria to think through when you're judging for predatory behavior. Um, so that's um, just linked in the slides for you to have a look at. And then, what I'll do now is I might turn it over to Jing now to um, talk about tools to find high impact open access journals. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Uh, yes, as you can see in this slide, uh, we list the four tools, actually the five tools. Uh, we think the use of uh, the combination of these uh, five tools can be uh, very powerful uh, for us to avoid uh, predatory journals and also find a high impact journal to publish our research output. So the first group is uh, Scopers and Web of Science. As we know, Scopers and Web of Science, they are two of the major indexing uh, databases. Scopers index more than uh, 30,000 um, academic journal articles and conference papers, and Web of Science index more than 20,000 uh, journals. Uh, the good thing uh, comparing Scopers and Web of Science with the uh, Google Scholar is uh, both Scopers and Web of Science, they have the independent um, panels to select the journals and also they keep monitoring uh, the performance of the, of the journals. So the um, lack of Web of Science, they have uh, to meet the indexing criteria um, in Web of Science, they, they set um, 40 to 60 uh, quite high level criteria. Uh, so basically, um, if we can find a journal indexed in Scopers and Web of Science, that basically uh, means uh, we will be, uh, we are looking for a safe pool and uh, predatory journals, um, it's very hard for them to meet all of this, uh, inquiry, uh, this uh, criteria to be indexed in Scopers or Web of, Web, Web of Science. So this is a safe places um, to find the journals. And another reason is, as we know, uh, we can find the citation information in Scopers and Web of Science uh, because the publications indexed in these two resources are um, citation tracked. That means you have the potential to get citations of your own publications and which is widely used as the academic, um, the evidence for your academic um, evidence. And Scopers and Web of Science, they have developed quite lots of tools to help us check the citations and use the citation-based metrics um, to find the impact or quality of the journals. So we can find the, uh, in searching Scopers and Web of Science, uh, we can find the highly impact journals related with our research topic and then we can also use the filters of open access uh, publishing. Um, okay and then the next is called the journal finder tool. This tool is actually developed by the Western Sydney University and the UTS library is planning to get this tool uh, hopefully next year. Uh, the benefit of using this tool is um, we can browse the journals uh, listed according to the era 
um, field of research codes because Z codes, remember that four number codes, they are normally very important when we uh, supply, uh, apply for the fundings um, from ARC. Um, yeah, so, so we can find the journals matching that four digit uh, for codes. It's very common. It. And the, the other good thing of this two is um, the, this tool actually uses the APIs to link to with the different um, resources like the Scopers of Web of Science um, and some other 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 vendors, and then we can find that they 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 related um, journal metrics and the links to the OA policy um, of the journals. So it's a it's a it's a very common in the tool. Uh, I mean, so um, if we are not able to find the good search results according to our uh, topic, research topic in Scopus and Web of Science, Journal Finder tool, it actually provides a nice browsing um, service for us to locate some journals, good journals, according to the four digit um, field of research code, which is matching the, 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 the era. Okay, so the next tool is called Directory of uh, Open Access Journals. So this tool is, uh, can be used to check the, uh, the license and article processing charges of the gold OA journals. And the DOAJ, um, this organization, it has the independent panel to select, evaluate, and monitor, monitor open access journal as well. So uh, when you have time, you can have a good look of the DOAJ website, and then you probably can find a, a journal, a list of the journals removed from this from DOAJ. So it's a, it's a, it's a relatively safer place to find the um, gold OA journals. Okay, and the last is called Sharpa Romeo. So Sarah introduced this already. We can check the um, green OA policies. Of, uh, of, uh, of lots of journals, including both OA and non-OA journals. Okay, so now I will just uh, run a quick demo of how we can use this tool, combine and use this tool. Okay, so I will share my screen. Right. Okay, so Scopers and the Web of Science are the library subscriptions, and we can find them from the library website. Um, so I suggest you to go to the um, library homepage, homepage, and then we click databases, uh, because we have a list of the tools uh, can help us to find the uh, publishing strategies or metrics. So if we click this category, and then um, we can locate the scopers. So click scopers. Okay, so, uh, sorry, it's just the toolbars uh, blocking my view. <laughs> yes, so we click, click scopers um, and then, okay, you can log on. And then we can run a quick search. Um, according to the research topic we are working on. Yeah, so just use the default screen. And then for example, uh, I want to look at the, um, the, the find some journals to publish the, um, I'm working on like the smart wheelchair. Um, so let's just uh, tap in our couple of keywords. So our suggestion is uh, keep your search keyword broad rather than narrower because we are looking for the potential journals to publish. We are not doing literature review or systematic review. So try to keep our search broad. Um, and a very um, useful um, technology to do our search is to try to sync the synonyms because uh, the different authors maybe uh, have different names for the same concept. So uh, we need to try to use uh, as many synonyms as possible to find the, all the relevant jour uh, journal uh, articles. Okay, so for the smart wheelchair, we sometimes may call it intelligent wheelchair, automatic wheelchair, 
So what we can do is uh, we can give smart some uh, synonyms. So we use or to combine the synonyms. Smart or intelligent or auto, automatic. So I now use uh, asterisk to truncate the ending of uh, auto. So it will search auto, automatic, auto, automatic, automatically. Okay. And then we can put all of the synonyms in a brackets to group them, combine them with or, and put and between, between the two different concepts. Okay, so if you have the synonym uh, to wheelchair, we can do that um, as well. Okay, so I just leave it as this and then run the search. Okay, so we found more than 4,000 um, results. So I can quickly show you if we um, do not. So I have another search, as I the search the smart and the wheelchair. So I, I did not use the synonyms and then I, I only got uh, less than 800 uh, results. So keep your search broad, try to use the synonyms as native keywords is really important uh, for our purpose, finding the, um, uh, the, the, the proper journal, the suitable journal to, to publish. Don't make your search too narrow. Um, otherwise, you may, you may miss um, the, uh, some quite good journals. Okay. okay, now in the result page, we can do some little bit of filter. So we will look at the open access options uh, very soon. But before that, let's uh, uh, look at the, some other filters first. So the year, uh, the year, I think these are very useful filters because we do not want to waste our time in the um, journals no longer active on our research um, topic. So I, depends on your research topic, if it's a quite recent or um, quite historical, uh, you can select um, the year level, year range you would like. Um, smart chair, because I think we, we re really want to focus on the recent technologies. So I limit to the current uh, five to six years. Okay, and then uh, some other filters we can try is subject area. I actually do not suggest you to uh, select this in the very beginning because uh, there are more and more uh, cross-discipline journals. Um, it's, it's possible a good place to publish in. Um, another filter we can consider is called the document type. Um, this is actually important. So the second one is called article. Article here means this research article. So if you want to publish your original research, then we we would better choose article because we do not want the journals to publish other type of the uh, documents. Uh, review means the review article. If you want to publish a review article, of course, the review is will be a better filter for you. Okay, so um, this is probably good enough. Document type and then the um, publishing publishing year, publication year. And then next, it depends on our situation. So as Sarah introduced, the gold OA is the uh, highest level of OA. Um, it offers the, uh, the best access and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the creative, um, uh, creative commons license. Okay, so, but normally gold OA will require the article charging fees. Uh, article processing charging fee. So if you have the funding, you have the financial support to pay the um, article processing process char charge, uh, then we can of course limit to OA only. So let's uh, choose this option and then click limit to. So, oh sorry, uh, I forgot one option. It's actually not only, uh, only OA. We can choose hybrid gold as well because uh, some non-gold OA journals say probably offer uh, one or two or a couple of articles in that issue open access, uh, but they but still they want you to pay the fee. Okay, so we choose this both and then click limit two. So this is in the situation you have the, the fund, the financial support to pay the APC and then uh, we can choose the best OA, gold OA journal to publish in. Okay. Now we have the search results. 
What we do the next is we click analyze search results. Analyze search results because we want to evaluate the journals a little bit. Okay, so don't worry about there are lots of information on this page. Uh, the type we are using is called documents per year by source. By source means by the journals because we want to compare the journals. Okay, so let's look at this list. This is the journals have published the most on your research topic in the recent five to six years. And all of these journals are either gold OA or offer the hybrid um, OA. Okay. So next, so we know the how many articles this each journal have published in, but how good are these journals? We can look at this figure on the right, right side and then compare sources and using the metrics called SETScore, SJR, and SNEEP. Okay, so I'll just click it and give you a quick view. We can actually uh, compare up to 10 uh, sources. Okay, so these metrics are based on the citations. If you want to know more of this, what these metrics means, there is the question mark and then you can know the definition and how these uh, uh, metrics are calculated. Uh, but so far, let's look at the, the graph. Um, the highest one is the journal, it's called the Journal of Neuroengineering and Rehabilitation. Okay, this sounds good. Okay, so this is give you the comparison of the, the journals according to their metrics. Uh, something I just want to quickly uh, mention is um, if the journals, if you find that the journals are actually uh, from the different research fields, uh, the SNEEP is a better, is a better matrix to, to, to benchmark them. Okay. All right. So this is where we can find the, um, we can compare the metrics of the journals. Okay. Um, so to look at the each journal, we need to go back to this page. Yeah, analyzing the uh, search result page. We can actually look at the uh, more information of each journal. So like attribute exercise, so we can look at the, uh, the, the rank, the rank. But this journal is actually um, indexed in two categories and then it has a different ranking in these uh, two different categories. So look at the percentile, percentile, um, 70, 87 means this journal is in the top, uh, is in the quartile one, because quartile one need to be, uh, need to be a, a, a equals to 70, uh, 75, 75 percentile. Okay. So this journal actually um, is in quartile one in both of these two categories. Okay. And then something else is that we can look at the, the ranking. So if we click the second tab, rank, then we will look at, we will find that all of the journals are in the same category. And then we can see the, the rank and then the uh, other highly ranked journals. So these journals can be the potential journals to consider as well because they are in the same uh, category. Okay, so let's go back. So this is basically how we can find the highly impact gold OA or hybrid OA. Uh, just be aware, we, we need to uh, be sure we have the, we are able to pay the publication fee. Um, in most of the cases, we do not have the money, uh, but how can we still uh, publish in the highly ranked journals and make our uh, publication open access? So this is, is actually a quite good question. So I will go back to my search results. Uh, yeah, go back to my original search results and show you how we can do that. Okay, so this case, in this case, okay, we need to do two, two steps um, to eliminate the, 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 the find the uh, red pool of the journals. We can, we can, um, we can evaluate. Okay, first we still limit to the recent five to six years. And then still we choose the article, means the research article. So we limit to these filters at first. 
And then the next, we can remove, eliminate, exclude the gold, the gold OA. Yeah, because we definitely do not want to pay to publish in the open access. Um, all the gold OAs, normally the gold OAs need to uh, charge the fees, as we explained before. So now we exclude the gold OA. Click OA gold and then click exclude. Okay, and then uh, all the articles are left are published from the non gold OA journals. Okay, we do the exactly same thing. Uh, we click analyze search results and then we go to the documents per year by source. Okay. This loading a little bit slow, slow. So let me see if I can find the previous um, search results. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, this is showing up. Yeah, so still you can look at the, the comparison by the different metrics and we can look at the each journal. Okay, so this journal has published a lot, but how, how about its uh, green OA policy? Uh, we use uh, the, the, the website called Sharp, Sharp, Sharp Normal, Sharp Normal. Romeo, sorry, Shapi Romeo. Uh, it's introduced by Sarah. Um, yeah, so because the time is quite limited, I, I will not show you uh, the search procedure. I just show you the results. Okay, um, it's, it should be here. So it's quite straightforward. We can search by the journal's name uh, or the uh, ISSN. And then we got this uh, information for this journal. This journal is published the most according to our scope, the search in scopers. And then if we look at their uh, publisher policy, okay. So for the accepted version, um, you can publish in institutional repository like Opus, but there are 12 months embargo. That means that you cannot make it open and after the 12 months, 12 months after your publication. And there is a pathway B. So if you have your personal blog, uh, yes, you can, um, you can put the full article in the home page of your blog. Yeah. And uh, submitted version, it uh, also allow you to uh, publish the, the version before the peer review and the, uh, any uh, editing service in the preprints archives. Okay. All right. A bit, uh, Lee looks at the, the, the green OA policy is not so nice because we have to wait uh, 12 months. So is there a better, is there a journal provide the uh, better um, policy, green OA policy? So I have found another one. Um, remember the second one, this one, no, this one, <laughs> sorry, guess. Yes, so I think, yeah, let's quickly show you the, Okay, a little bit slow. Because, uh, no, no, this one, it's probably this one, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So remember, we'll just check the first one. So let's check uh, another one. Say, uh, I triple E robotics and automation letters. Let's look at the OA policy of this journal. So I look at it in Sharpa Romeo, and then it looks like this. Okay, so it looks nicer. Look at the the accept version path A. Um, yes, we can put it in the uh, institutional repository like the opus and then there is no embargo. So that means that we can uh, put it, make it open um, just after the publication. Um, yeah, because this is the information according Sharpa Romeo, uh, but before doing that, we, we really need to uh, double check in the publisher's website. But anyway, this is a good indication that this journal is uh, probably um, better for us to consider if we want to make our research output open uh, as soon as possible. Okay, so there are other pathways. This, uh, the second one means uh, founder designated location is uh, means after two years, um, the publisher will make your paper uh, open access on their, on their website, probably, on the publisher's website. That is, is nice as well. Okay, so, so this is uh, basically how we use these multiple tools to find, the, uh, to find some um, journals. Um, either gold, either paid away, 
were um, without paying, um, without paying, and and put our research output uh, publication um, in a great OA access. It's mainly the institutional um, repository or other subject repositories. Okay, so I talked a little bit fast, but we will share the recording and also the, 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 the slides with you. Uh, the last one just gave you a quick um, snap. So this is the Journal Finder 2. Um, as you can see, they are listed by the, um, by the era for code. And then, uh, because you may find if, if, you, if your topic is in the humanities or business, you may do not have good search results from the scopers or web of science. So this tool can be a good, um, a good addition for you uh, or backup resource for you, like uh, for example, indigenous studies. So you can um, browse by the uh, four digit code and then try to find the, the journalists and it gives you quite a um, lot in the information of the, of the journals uh, listed in this tool. So it's uh, loading a little bit. Uh, if it load too, if it's too slow, I probably will just stop because it used to be quick. Anyway, so just uh, um, keep an eye of the, of this tool. We will um, get this to uh, next year as well. Oh, okay. Anyway, so I, I don't think I'm able to show you this tool uh, right now because uh, there are something okay accessing issues. But this is a nice tool, just to remember. If you are not able to find the suitable journals from Scopus or Web of Science, there is something uh, you can check by using the four digit four codes. Okay, I think that that's all for me. Um, yeah, it's already over time. Sorry about this, everyone. Okay. Um, no problem. for talking too much. Um, I'll just share my slides again so we can just finish off um with a list of resources so again these slides are all hyperlinked and we will share them with you um, on this final slide here um, we've just got lists um links to resources that can be useful so we've linked the open access publishing page from the uh, library website we've also um, linked to some faculty whitelists that are available via staff connect in case you could have a look um, and we also have links to each of the tools that we showed um, in today's workshop um, in this handy uh, list here. Um, if you do have a question, please do feel free um, to get into contact with us. Um, if you'd like to have a conversation about um, finding um, high impact open access journals, or if there's anything we can help with, um, please do contact us. Um, but if you have time, please do um, leave us um, any feedback. This is the first time we've run a session like this, so we'd appreciate it um, if you shared your views on what was helpful um, and anything we can do to improve the session. So actually it's a question from Tamara about does it matter if you can find the journal in one of those websites but not the others? Um, uh, yes, Scop oh sorry, sorry, I want to go. No, you go, Jean. <laughs> oh, okay, yes, Scopers and Web of Science, these uh, two, two resources do have the different, uh, different coverage, um, but both of them have the quite good selection criteria, so so the journals index, indexing either of these two, two tools uh, should be uh, legitimate. So they, they, they should not be the predatory, quite reliable. Yeah. Did I answer your question tomorrow? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? No? Yeah, I think we probably can finish the, the session. <laughs>